Welcome to section two, camera basics. We're gonna take care of a few very basic things in here, but also a few very important things. We'll talk for just a moment about being a mirrorless camera and a, having a full frame sensor, along with a few of the primary controls that we're gonna need for the remainder of this class. And we're gonna get our file format set correctly because that is a really important feature to have set correctly from the get-go. All right, so we have a mirrorless camera here. Light comes in through the lens. There is an aperture unit that controls light coming in. That's our first control for light. As light comes into the image sensor, we do still have a physical shutter in here. There are two parts to it. There is the first curtain and the second curtain. Now, because this is a mirrorless camera and you need to see what's going on, these curtains are normally both open so that you can either see on the LCD screen on the back of the camera or the EVF framing and composition. When it comes time to actually take a photo, well, there's a number of things that happen. Let's bring in a second sensor so we can show you from two different angles of view. What happens is that the first shutter will close, momentarily giving you a dark image in the viewfinder, and then first shutter opens, and then the second shutter closes, and then the second shutter opens again, capturing light for that brief moment of time. And so, that is our second way of controlling light. Now we do have shutter speeds in this case all the way up to 64 thousandth of a second when you use the electronic shutter. The top shutter speed in the mechanical shutter is 1 8 thousandth of a second and this is something that we will talk more about as we get deeper into this class. All right, so those are your few basic components of a mirrorless camera. Now one of the most important aspects to any camera is the sensor size. This uses a full frame sensor and there are lots of other great cameras on the market that use different size sensors. Some of them smaller, some of them larger, but this is the largest of the common sizes. This is popular because, well, this is what a lot of serious photographers shot when 35 millimeter film was the main choice of professionals and keeping that as they transition to digital was important and that's kind of where we are today. And this is where a lot of the best cameras are is in this full frame category. There's a lot of other great cameras, as I say, with smaller size sensors that have a different set of trade-offs when you go smaller in size. But in this case, we have very good image quality with a very large sensor on it. Now the basic controls that we're gonna be needing to work with, first off is the on and off. Now when you turn the camera on, a little side note here, the image sensor goes through a dust cleaning little protocol where it kind of shakes the dust to try to get it off of the sensor itself because any sort of dust on the sensor is gonna manifest itself in light areas as a dark spot. It's just gonna look like a black or dark spot on your images. This will be particularly noticeable on white walls or blue skies, uh, places of kind of very clean contrast, you might say. And so uh, we will talk more about cleaning the sensor later in this class, but just every time you turn it on and off, it's going through this. It does make a little bit of noise and that's perfectly normal. The camera is just doing its thing. Now, probably the most important control to have set properly on this camera is the stills and movie mode on this. You can rotate this dial to put the camera in a movie shooting system or a stills system. It changes the menu, it changes almost everything about how this camera works. And so you really gotta make sure that you have that dial set to where you want it to. It does make it very easy to switch over from one setting to the next, which is great. But just be aware that that is probably one of the first things that you, you should check when you take your camera out of the bag or you're ready to shoot with it is that it's in the right mode and that you didn't accidentally leave it or bump it into the wrong mode. Now, as far as the general buttons on the camera, well, of course we have our shutter release for horizontal shooting at least. Uh, we have a number of dials on the camera. We have the main dial. We have Canon's trademark quick control dial one on the back of the camera. Not really liking the name of the next one, quick control dial number two, kind of on the upper right hand shoulder of the body. And this allows you three different dial controls for three different exposure settings or a variety of settings. There's a lot of things that you can customize here that we'll get into later on in this class. Many of the lenses have a control ring, which you can also have control an additional feature or function. There is the multi-controller, I'll probably call it the joystick, and this is gonna be used for moving the focusing point around or navigating throughout the menu or magnified image, a lot of different reasons. 
The Smart Controller is a relatively new feature to Canon. They've had in probably, I think, only one other previous camera, 1D, 1D series camera. And this is kind of like an inverted mouse. It's got a touchpad, but it's a very small touchpad that kind of tells which direction your finger is moving across it. My kind of guess is that some people are really going to like this, and there's going to be some people that really don't like it. Uh, but there is a lot of very specific, specific customized controls that you can do with this that allow it to be turned on and off at different times that I think is very smart. And I think most people are going to be able to find a happy medium place where they get to use that in a way that really helps them out. The set button in the middle of the quick control dial is, of course, uh, important because this is where you're going to enter information. If you have a setting in the menu that you have highlighted, you'd hit set here to confirm that that is the setting you want. So you'll be using that quite frequently when you want to confirm a concept. Now, the camera also has a touch screen like a lot of the other Canon cameras. This has a very good touch screen that you can use in a variety of modes from shooting to playback to scrolling through the menu. Some people like using the touch screen, some people don't. Um, there is nothing that you really have to use on the touch screen. It's purely optional. So if you prefer using the physical tactile controls, you can use those. And if you want to use the touch screen, you're free to do that as well. When you press down on the shutter release, like virtually all other cameras, it's got a two-stage release on it, which means when you press halfway down, well, first off, it's going to wake the camera up if it's asleep, and cameras like to go to sleep a lot so that they can save battery power. It will return you to the shooting mode. So if you're lost in the menu and you just want to get out and shoot photos, then you just press that down halfway. It also activates the metering and focusing system, albeit those things can be customized and changed if you want. And of course, pressing down fires the shutter for taking the photo. But just be aware that there's a lot of things going on at that halfway press. And if you want to go in and customize the button, custom function four is a section that we'll be spending quite a bit of time on, and I'll be showing you how to customize a number of different buttons. If you want to do back button focusing with the camera, I'll show you that in the focusing section. Like many of the recent Canon cameras, this has what's known as a multi-function button. For a long time, Canon had a button very prominent up near the shutter release that allowed you to quickly change your ISO. Well, Canon has just kind of taken that button and expanded it to five specific controls that you can go to. And this is a great way uh, for you to be able to quickly dive into one of these modes, make a change, and be done with it without really having to go into the menu system. You can do all this from the viewfinder or the top of the camera um, or the back of the camera. Uh, your choice in there, so a lot of different options. If you want this just to become an ISO button like in older Canon cameras, yes, you can do that because you can go in and take any one of these modes and you can take them out or put something else in. Lots more to talk about in that particular case. So when you press this button, you can use either of the quick control dials for choosing which function you want. And then once you are at the function you want, you turn the main dial to adjust that specific setting. And it always returns to the last place that you left off. So if you're only changing the ISO, you press the button, you adjust your ISO, and then the next time you press the button, you're there at the ISO to change that again. And so it's a pretty good button. And as I say, if you want to customize it, we'll be doing more of that later on in the class, but you can jump ahead to custom function four and do that right now if you want to. One of the most important settings in any camera is the file format. What type of file are you recording to the memory card? So with digital cameras, one of the best types of files that you can record is what is known as a raw format. This is all the original information off the sensor. It gives you the greatest tonal range, gives you the most workable image in post-production possible. Unfortunately, it is a little bit larger in file size and does require the right software to make it all work and run. A more common file type is JPEG. Now these are gonna be compressed processed images that are a little bit easier and faster to work with for many people in some situations where it's fast moving and they don't wanna fuss with processing all their images. And so uh, JPEG files are very popular with a lot of sports photographers. I know I've shot them for sports because you shoot through so many images and you wanna transfer your images, you wanna have them fill up memory cards, you wanna get more of them on a memory card. Uh, JPEG images can be a very smart choice for people who've got their exposures down, they kind of 
got the settings right on their camera so that they know that they're getting good results and they're not trying to wildly adjust their images later on. Now this camera does have a relatively new option in here. It's called a Hyfe format. I like to think of it as an improved JPEG. It's kind of like JPEGs in that it's a processed image. It's compressed in file size. It's small. It's easy to transfer, but it has a little bit greater range of dynamic ability with light. And so you can do a little bit more adjustment with the highlights and shadows with the Hyfe images. Now, if you dive into shoot menu number two, into HDR shooting, the HDR PQ, you can basically turn that feature on and off. And when you turn it on, you put your camera in the Hyf mode. When you turn it off, you are in the JPEG mode. And that is gonna result in other menus saying either JPEG or Hyf. And so that's the one master control for either JPEG or Hyf images. Now, in shoot menu number one, under image type and size, this is where you get to make your main choices over whether you want a RAW file or a JPEG file. So let's look at some of those options a little bit more closely. So first up, we have our standard Canon RAW file, which has been great. It's CR3 file at this time. It's 24 megapixels, going to be about 21 megabytes in size. And that's going to be a great way to go if you want the absolute best quality option out of this camera. Next up is a compact RAW size. And so what Canon has done is they've taken their RAW file, they've reduced the size of it, and they have done their best to not hurt image quality in any way possible. I'm always suspicious when I hear those sorts of claims. And so I like to do lots of testing. And from my testing, I have found that there is virtually zero difference between RAW and the compact RAW. I've looked for other people who've done testing and I really haven't found anybody who's found any significant difference between these two other than the file size itself. And so I shoot C-RAW pretty much exclusively. Uh, I like getting that higher quality RAW file out of the camera. The compressed size without any apparent loss of quality uh, is a very good option in my opinion. Next up, we have either JPEG or HIFE options in here. And this is where we're gonna have different resolutions possible. So the large is the full 24 megapixels. If you know that you don't need 24 megapixels, you can set it to medium, small one, or small two, depending on what your needs are in there. Generally speaking, I would hesitate on doing that because the camera doesn't have an overabundance of megapixels to start with. And if you are shooting sports or anything like that, where you do need to crop from time to time, having those 24 megapixels is very helpful. So I think there are some people who will find the large JPEG or HIFE options as a good option for them. I think other people, the compact or compressed RAW is gonna be very good. I think for some people, they may still wanna shoot with the RAW. Uh, just make sure for the compact RAW that it does work with the software that you like to use. There possible that there is something out there that reads the RAW very easily, but the compact RAW, not so easily. And so be aware of that difference between the two. So let me go ahead and show you in the back of the camera, setting this up and just a little bit around about what's going on in here. All right, so we'll hit the menu button. And strangely to me, the first item is the JPEG and Hive quality. So if you are setting JPEGs or Hive, you can choose the exact quality, the compression level. And so if you want the large, large resolution, but you want it smaller in size, you could choose see something between one and four. If you want higher quality, it comes currently set to eight as a default. But you know, if you want a really small size, you go down to small two, which is low resolution, and then you set it to uh, its smallest compression. And you can see it goes from the smooth lines to the jaggy lines to let you know how much it's compressing that file. And as I say, kind of strangely, that would be maybe the second item in this list. I think the most important one is the second item in here, which is the image type size. Now, you're going to have options in here if you turn the main dial from RAW and the compact RAW, or you can choose not to shoot them. You can turn the back dial to choose what size JPEG you want. Now, you do have to select something. If you just press this, well, it's going to choose a JPEG for you. And so I typically leave it here. Uh, but I have good reason for also shooting it here. Uh, so this is just something to be aware of, is that you can shoot simultaneously both 
raw and JPEG if you want. You can separate them from one card to the other. I'll show you more about that a little later on. And so choose the file type that you want to have. I'm going to leave it at compressed raw right in here, compact one, and leave it there. All right, so that is your file format choices. Obviously, very important choice, which is why I'm talking about it very early on in this class. And you may want to try your own testing on this to see which formats work for you, which ones work with the software and the people that you work with. And so just always make sure that those things work before you shoot something very important. All right, there you go. That's the camera basics. And it's going to be time to get into the really good stuff in the next section where we talk about everything dealing with exposure.